Okay, so week, what is it, four? Week four of existentialism. Welcome back. Um, glad to have you all again. Um, for this week, we read the first half, the um, literary half, it literary-ish half of Fear and Trembling from Kierkegaard, um, which we'll be talking about today. So um, just to sort of recap on what we've done so far, um, in the first week, we began with a discussion of the problem of being, the sort of perspective from which all of our existentialists and you know these sort of proto-existentialists um, are approaching uh, the issues that they contend with in their works, which is existence preceding essence, right? There's no idea out there um, that uh, we participate in as, as people, and insofar as we participate in it, uh, we uh, live idealized. No, that there's nothing like that. Um, ideas are, are derivative of being an experience which comes first, right? So uh, there's no uh, image of man constructed by God. There's no essential good. Uh, there is no uh, way that is th th that we ought to be, right? We need to figure that out for ourselves. And how do we do that? And if we're just positing that there is a way that we ought to be, what justifies that? And isn't it just absurd that uh, we are ad hocing our way through a meaningless world looking for meaning itself, right? So um, existence preceding essence presents a problem um, in that the world and our relationship to it begins to look absurd. And this absurd condition has an effect on us, right? That, that we feel it. It's not just a theoretical problem, something that as soon as you begin to, to consider in your armchair by the fire, uh, what's what that you begin to contend with. No, it's something that we deal with in our everyday lives. It's something that like strikes us and hits us right at the heart of our everyday lived experience, which we saw in um, gross manifests in Marceau's character of the stranger. Um, the, the feeling of absurd, uh, the absurdity of being um, sort of writ large and, and personified uh, in many ways by Marceau and, and not often pretty much entirely until the very end of the novel um, construed negatively, right? That Marceau is not a redeemable character that his indifference to everything and sort of flowing through the absurd with no uh, purpose leads him into some pretty terrible circumstances that even Camus himself but certainly like wrote the character that way on purpose, um, not to be loved, not to be liked, but to show that even the most despicable among us um, is equally stuck in the absurd. And even the most despicable among us is equally capable of redemption through rebellion against that absurd condition. Um, and last week we talked about resignation or rebellion against this absurd condition. Right. Dostoevsky's um, uh, Ivan. Ivan tells the Grand Inquisitor poem, uh, which is meant to be a kind of rebellion, a kind of uh, redemption uh, of the human spirit that is capable of standing against the absurd to make the world one that's worth accepting, because the absurd world has no justification um, available to it for the suffering of children, the loss of innocence. Uh, this is just not how the, the world works or is, but it ought to, and it can, says Ivan through his mouthpiece of the Grand Inquisitor. Um, but how terrible a price do we have to pay to get a world that we can accept one without suffering? Well, it costs everything. It costs our freedom, right? Um, and that's rebellion. So really what we've been thinking about these last three weeks and now month is what is the absurd, one, and two, how do we cope with it? And every author that we've read has given a slightly different answer to this, this question, how to cope with the absurdity and where the, the absurdity like manifests itself, right? Um, and Kierkegaard gives his own answer um, as we read for today. Um, and uh, purposefully, given the way that I've sort of structured our syllabus, our readings have grown progressively more Gnostic and Christian, right? Um, so we start with uh, Camus, who is you know like an atheist, um, or 
some form of atheist. I, I think he probably would have said God's existence doesn't matter or something like that. Um, I'm not sure he would have been like dogmatically atheist, but I don't really know for sure. Um, and then we discussed Dostoevsky, who was Orthodox Christian, but not in any recognizable way. Um, Dostoevsky was uh, committed to the existence of God, um, but too aware of the place and presence, the transparency of, of evil in the world to um, accept God in a uh, straightforwardly Christian way. Dostoevsky needed to write thousands of pages of intense literature um, to help himself cope and find a way through the, the mire of weeds of absurdity that is this problem of evil. And Kierkegaard now is just straightforwardly Christian. Um, Kierkegaard is uh, maybe the first like true existentialist. Um, Kierkegaard uh, is unlike the existentialist that we'll look at later in the course, the like period in which existentialism has a proper name and people call themselves existentialists. Kierkegaard is not a part of this, but he's lumped in uh, because he takes the problem of being to be sort of his primary um, issue to contend with. Uh, and his answer to it is uh, ultimately to have faith, to take a leap of faith, to accept and uh, love the power of God or, or whatever. Um, in order to um, contend with the uh, problem of being that uh, one uses absurdity and all of its contradictions to resolve the contradictions of being. Um, okay, so we just talked about all that. Uh, oh, uh, I'll talk about more later, but in Fear and Trembling, uh, Kierkegaard is not writing as Kierkegaard, he's writing as Johannes de Silencio, um, which was uh, characteristic of Kierkegaard throughout his career. He used uh, pseudonyms in, I think, all of his publications, most, at least, of his publications, um, which leads to some really interesting secondary literature on interpreting Kierkegaard, because he has a different voice and different storytelling style in many of uh his works, which lead to contradictory ideas, but we'll talk about that some more later. Um, and again, in this week's leading, reading, we learned that through faith, being is not a problem, but an achievement when one engages in the dance of the night of faith and takes the leap of faith. So before we get into the content, I'm, I'm curious, what, did you, what were your general impressions of Kierkegaard's answer to the question of like how we cope with, with absurdity? Like how did, how did we respond to the reading in general. Yeah, Jason. When he was talking about Abraham, it drug a lot for me. He couldn't love that part. But once he actually started talking about like describing the night of faith, it was a lot more interesting to me. Like I don't know if I agreed with all of it, but it was fun. Yeah, I had that experience too. Um, I really like the the four stories, uh, the four different ways of interpreting Abraham. I just like adore those. They're really cool. Um, I mean, that the Genesis is just like God said, yo, Abraham, and Abraham says, here I am. And then it happens in like 20 lines that uh, Abraham goes to Moriah and sacrifices Isaac. And so giving like some humanity, some storytelling to the Genesis is excellent. And all of those stories are consistent. But then as soon as we get into the preamble stuff, it does slow down. I think it's important context, but... Um, but yeah, the, the night of faith stuff is where like, the real philosophical meat is. What else did, did, did anybody else have? Yeah, Ruby. I was actually the exact opposite where I fell hard the second he started talking about Abraham. <laughs> Same. I, I could barely finish it. In fact, I actually didn't. Oops. <laughs> but uh, I, I forgot the last two pages. But um, like uh, just from like a very basic standpoint, I really, I really like the voice that he had uh it, it kind of surprised me when he actually started using i because i'm used to like not seeing that in context of like a you know a work like like this mm -hmm. uh but i also just like the kind of like periodic jokes mm -hmm. like i feel like i like the part where he implies that ludists aren't human beings mm -hmm. uh or just the point where he goes if i finally found this person i'd be i the first thing i would say is you look like a banker 
Yeah. You look like a, look like a tax collector. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. The Knight of Faith looks like a, a penny pusher, right? Yeah. yeah he was, he just, I, you look like a tax collector. I don't know. I just really like the like slight humor. Like it, it kind of added to this tone of like, especially coming off of uh, the previous works, which were like ultimately interesting, if not kind of dour. This one feels really just extremely like hopeful and upbeat and kind of goofy a little bit at times. And I, I kind of like that. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and uh, I like the pointing out of the use of the personal pronouns, right? So um, Johannes de Silencio is the, the author, the, the pseudonymical, pseudonymed, the, the named author, right, is a character himself. And in this work, uh, he's a character who calls himself, uh, I think it's a philosopher, not a poet, right? Someone who is uh, resigned to the world and so can see it clearly and talks about it, but doesn't like take that leap of faith himself. Um, he can't even imagine what it would be like to take the leap of faith, though he describes it, you know, that like gives content to it. Um, and, and there's a whole lot of tongue in cheek, which is uh, characteristic of Kierkegaard generally, um, and why it's hard to interpret uh, or hard, why it's at least challenging to make sense of what Kierkegaard really thought, because the, the tongue in cheek and um, different voices, the different authors as unique characters, um, as unique narrators, um, does, they all have their own personalities, right? So which one was Kierkegaard's? Uh, and it, it takes an interpretive mind to, um, to draw out the right connections. It's good. Kirsty, you had your hand up? Yeah, I mean, I thought, I mean, I have not read Kierkegaard's all this um, from a couple of people, but like I actually really liked the like, I thought it was like it was kind of the same. Like I thought his point where he was using like the story of Abraham kind of as this like allegory to like make his case was like really powerful. Like I thought he had a really good argument. It was like basically I don't remember the exact word, but he says something along the lines of he who works gets the bread. And he was like trying to explain that, like basically say that the world itself is imperfect and there's like a lot of imperfection but like through believing in like this greater power of like you know for him god that's like where it can kind of be reconciled like for like we're, uh, like he said something about like the world like the extra i think it's like i don't know the exact quote but it's something like the external world as it is is imperfect in the world of spirit it is otherwise so i thought it was like really interesting that he was like kind of using the story of your hand to show that all of us our belief is like what will like make everything okay kind of Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the whole perspective of the novel is set in place by the first line of the preface, which you've alluded to, not only in the commercial world, but in the realm of ideas as well. Our age is holding a veritable clearance sale. Everything is had so dirt cheap that it is doubtful whether in the end anyone will bid, right? That, and what he's saying is, look, we've become too materialistic. Um, it's is I think it's Oscar Wilde who says everyone knows the price of everything and the value of nothing, right? Um, that all we have are these numbers and estimations of objects in the world, and we have no spiritual life left, right? We live so two dimensionally. Um, uh, if you've seen the movie My Dinner with Andre, the I can't remember the name of the actor, but it's the inconceivable inconceivable guy from The Princess Bride. Yeah, at the very beginning, um, he says, look, in my 20s, all I thought about was uh, art and creativity. And now that I'm in my 30s, all I think about is money, right? And this is the, the sort of spirit that, that Johannes de Silencio is invoking to inspire us to become faithful. And this is, this is my take now um, to, to this point. I don't think that we need to be theists or Catholics like Kierkegaard was to take his point seriously, that there is a spiritual quality to being um, and that it's something that has been drawn, like trying to find spiritual power in the world today and even apparently back then, it's like trying to draw blood from a stone, right? And that's, that's an issue. Um, and if only we respected um, the, the spiritual power of the world through faith or whatever, um, we might find more value in it. Um, now, whether or not 
that's a workable system is an empirical question. Who knows? But at least as a poet or a philosopher, it's it's a it's a pretty thought. And I like it. Yeah. So thanks. Anybody online have? Oh, Ryan, you had some impressions. Yeah. Um, the what you just said reminded me. There was like a footnote somewhere where he's talking about making the movement to uh, infinite resignation and uh, how that move takes like passion and you can't do it with just sitting around and reflecting on things. Um, I thought that was really interesting. And I had a question about that too, because my reading of that was like that the leap of faith and the move to infinite resignation, my reading is anyway, is that it takes like kind of almost like that passions like kind of goes beyond like rationality. Like when I think reflection, I think philosophers sitting around making rational arguments, but the passion is sort of like this irrational move, like a poetic sort of heart that you need to, to have to make that move, uh, that leap of faith into the absurd. And I was wondering if, I don't know, if anyone else in the class had that thought too, or I don't know how that reading was because I'm not so sure on it, but that's kind of how I uh, took it. Did anybody else pick up on the passion part that's required to take the leap of faith? I think because like I saw the uh, how much faith was a influence in the book, uh, this is a part of how if I have faith, then I'm supposed to be doing this like for Abraham's Abraham stuff. Uh, he was just questioning the, how faith worked for him uh, in one of them. And I was like, that's really interesting. One who is just a psychopath wanting to, wanting to kill his son. He's like, I would do this because God wanted me to. And another who was just saying, I love my child so much. And he loved, this guy loves all of his children. And it was a really cool like, concept of like, the faith and seeing all the facets of faith. Yeah. And if I uh, pretend to be a psychopath, then my son will not lose faith in God and only me, right? Because it becomes my fault. And so I'm protecting my son in that way. The mother who weans the child, right? So thankfully she didn't have to wean too early, whatever. Um, yeah, so the the passion, the the human, the, the aesthetic power that's required to move from infinite resignation to faith, to see absurdity as an opportunity um, is, is all bound up in, um, you know, coping, right? So we'll talk about that too. Uh, it doesn't appear here the, the sort of superstructure to the, that system of thinking. It's earlier works from Kierkegaard, um, but I'll introduce that. So Kierkegaard thinks there's three kinds of life. There's the aesthetic life, which precedes the ethical life, which precedes the religious life. And this all involves passion and um, reason and, and their progression along with one another. So um, that'll, that'll come up. Good. Okay. So sounds like we had a pretty solid understanding of, of the book. We picked up on sort of the key themes already. Very excellent. So um, who was Kierkegaard besides this dashing young lad? Um, he was a Danish guy who never left Copenhagen, even though Johannes de Silencio says, look, I've traveled the world looking for United States and have found him nowhere. Um, Kierkegaard was not well-traveled. He was a Christian theologian and a poet, a grandfather to existentialism, ironist, cringy, probably both. He uh, has some questionable uh, stories in his literary catalog, um, but it, it I, what is it? Diary of a Seducer, I think is what it's called. It's like the super cringy Kierkegaard one. Um, it's another pseudonym. And I, I think that cringy in the same sort of way that Janice from The Sopranos is cringy, if you've seen The Sopranos. Like, she, she was written really well and acted out really well to be just this character that you hate, awful, all the way through, right? Um, and so the audience hated her, of course, um, but like with reason. And I think the same is probably true of the main character of Diaries of a Seducer. I think he's supposed to be like an ironic character, but the like white knight cringery of, of the character is just like palpable in your face, it's hard to read. Um, but this sort of, again, speaks to um, the mystery that Kierkegaard uh, built around himself as, as an author and as a thinker. Um, he used pseudonyms to hide his identity and 
uh, remain ambiguously responsible for his writing. So he could pretty much say whatever um, and get away with it. <laughs> Why would you leave Copenhagen, Lauren asks. Good question. Um, okay, so Kierkegaard's philosophical life project in general, as I mentioned, he thought that there were these three uh, forms of life. And uh, some people don't ascend any higher than the first um, or the second, and only Abraham and perhaps even Job get to the religious, the night of faith lives the religious life. But um, we live aesthetic, ethical, or religious lives, and these are sort of progressions upon one another, spiritual progressions, existential progressions, right? So the aesthetic stage of existence is characterized by the following, an immersion in sensuous experience, a valorization of possibility over actuality, egotism, fragmentation of the subject of experience, a nihilistic wielding of irony and skepticism and flight from boredom, right? So you're living a life ruled by your passions, basically, in the aesthetic life, which is, you know, many of us and often uh, find ourselves living this way, right? Where we're uh, so focused on self-development that we get lost in an ego, where we uh, valorize and, and love the fact that anything is possible over turning things to reality, right? Um, maybe you stay perpetually single so that you can just like always be in the opportunity to fall in love, but you know, it's not actually being in love, right? So it's, you're, you're loving the, the idea of what could be rather than the actuality of um, being in that state. Um, the fragmentation of the subject of experience is to say, look, in, uh, in, uh, if I'm going to fragment myself in the classroom, I'm, uh, I'm a teacher and then, uh, uh, outside the classroom I'm someone completely different, right? I um, sort of compartmentalize my personalities and each one lives their own individual life. I, I don't, I at least try not to, but um, the person living the aesthetic experience um, approaches the world passionately and the, the form of passions that are inspired by say like an academic dialogue or exchange are different than the sorts uh, uh, enticed at uh, a bar over beer or you know dinner with your family or whatever right and so you have different personalities for the different sorts of passions that are experienced the ethical stage stage two after you ascend from the aesthetic is the ethical so um this is characterized by recognition of the universal and humankind that um my passions are not just mine but they come from a place that every one of us shares right there's a human dignity some kind of soul or whatever that um, lives in all of us, and before I see differences, I see what makes us the same, which is a whole lot, right? Um, an understanding of social norms, right? So I'm, I'm not just uh, willfully satisfying my every desire or the desires that um, seem great for me to, to satisfy at any given moment, but I sort of recognize that my actions have consequences, right? That uh, the things that I do affect others and that I need to care for others insofar as we all share this, you know, the golden rule, don't let your good time ruin someone else's good time. Golden rule party. Um, and three, how duty guides and justifies actions aimed at benefiting the community, the universal prior to the individual in particular. It's important to build up those around us, to build up the world, to um, make it better than we found it. Right? This is the ethical stage. You shift the locus of your interest, um, of your acts and your works from um, what's good for me to what's good. Right? And then uh, for Kierkegaard, Christian faith is not a matter of regurgitating church dogma, and it's through faith that one takes the next step from the ethical life to the religious. Faith is a matter of individual subjective passion, which cannot be mediated by the clergy or by human artifacts. Faith is the most important task to be achieved by a human being because only on the basis of faith does an individual have a chance to become a true self. In the religious stage, one embodies this passion through faith and unifies the aesthetic and the ethical. So it's by attending to our rational qualities, what we see unifies the world, what sort of slices it up and um, how we can find consistency and storytelling of, of how to make sense of that world through um, uh, an ethical kind of life. And also understanding the fact that we're passionate beings, that we have um, individuality that 
yearns to be recognized and satisfied. Um, and finding a place for these two qualities of being to uh, be made consistent. This is done, says Kierkegaard, through faith. And when our ethical life is also a passionate life, an aesthetic life, we are sort of the, in the religious stage. And there's no more important character in religious theology, according to Kierkegaard, than Abraham, who represents this final um, stage of uh, being, this highest quality of being in the religious life. Abraham is a knight of faith, as Kierkegaard will call them. He represents the teleological suspension of the ethical, which we will barely talk about, but this is sort of like what the content of um, faith is, is to um, suspend the ethical for the sake of some better end in itself. And though this turns out to be contradictory, um, will work out for the best because, you know, God. Um, and Abraham is an exemplar of the religious life, the, the religious being. As Kierkegaard understands the term insofar as Abraham receives God's saving grace by virtue of his faith in both absurdity and in infinite resignation, which we will also talk about. So why does Abraham serve this purpose? Well, um, what's the story of, of Abraham? Abraham was promised by God to be the father of nations. So Abraham is... Uh, uh, I don't know, it must be like in his 20s or 30s, and he has a whole family inheritance to look forward to, and God says, yo, uh, walk the land, follow me, have faith in me, and uh, I will make you the father of nations. It's a promise, right? And Abraham says, okay, and he turns away from his father and his mother and his family and his inheritance, and he takes his, uh, I think, to-be wife, I'm not sure if Sarai and Abraham were married, but um, leaves with her. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your, oh, and by the, Abram is Abraham before his covenant with God, um, and Sarai is Sarah. They got renamed after God said, okay, you, you, you're one of mine now. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, the promised land. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's a pretty dope promise, right? That's exciting. So Abraham says, okay. Um, without knowing that it would be about 100 years before uh, that promise would be even sort of close to fulfilled. Uh, so Abram and Sarai, Abraham and Sarah wander the land. They go to like Egypt for a long time, and uh, Sarah has a, an affair or almost an affair with the Pharaoh, and, and like says, no, I'm, I'm in love with Abraham. So the Pharaoh kicks him out, and um, they're wandering the desert, and never satisfied. The promise never comes, and uh, the whole land sort of knows Abraham and Sarah as these fools, basically, who accepted this promise that is never fulfilled, and um, yet they think that they'll be the the parents of nations. Um, during this time, Sarah gives birth to no children. How can you be the father of nations if you are no father at all? And this wears on Abraham. He always wants a kid. He, he wants his, um, his story, his genes, his life to go forward. And in despair, some 50 years after their wandering, Sarah says, hey, Abraham, I, I know you really want a kid, so um, take my, uh, my bed servant as uh, a lover and have a kid. And so they do. And uh, Abraham and Hagar uh, give birth to Ishmael, who, uh, as the story goes, is the father of um, Islamism. So Islam is the tradition that follows from Ishmael and Judaism and Christianity follow from uh, Isaac. So uh, Hagar gives birth to Abraham's firstborn son, though a bastard, Ishmael, um, and Sarah gets jealous. She thought it, she could handle it, but couldn't, and so banishes both Hagar and Ishmael to themselves. Walk the desert. Get the hell out of my tent. I don't want you here anymore. I can't stand to see you. You are representations of my 
uh, frailty, my inability to, to conceive, and I can't stand it. And so mother and child are banished, just like father and mother. So to sum up, Abraham is basically a really old homeless guy who's wandering around from town to town, inspired by a vague promise given to him more than half a century ago by a God that nobody really believes in except Abraham. His only son is a bastard whose sight his wife hates, and so they were both banished. Right? Um, and he and his wife are 80 years old, unable to conceive, somehow still young enough for the possibility, as the story goes, but um, so far beyond the point of uh, any natural birth. And so we see sort of this struggle that Abraham lives for nearly a century, where any normal person would lose faith, would give up, and did waver, right? Wavered with Hagar and Ishmael, but keeps the faith. And so keeps on and eventually, um, uh, it, by remaining in faith, God gifts Abraham and Sarah, a trueborn son in Isaac. But their joy in Isaac would not last long. Isaac, again, is now the representation of a hundred years, an entire century of, uh, of promise. And it's finally realized in Isaac. But God uses Isaac to test Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and Abraham says, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. And so we get this story, the binding of Isaac. This painting is a Caravaggio painting, by the way. And, and I love it because of Abraham's, like, terrible look right his consternation his pain you see all of it you see absurdity writ on his face here and so abraham takes his family close to the land of moriah close to the mountain uh leaves uh his his servant and his wife and takes the donkey and takes three days with his son isaac saying nothing chopping the wood for the fire that he would burn his son's body on um, taking his son up the mountain three days, three whole long days where he's contemplating, who knows, deciding, but certainly is in the act of following through with this test, with this command. And so at the fatal moment, Abraham binds his son, who's like 30 by now, so not really a kid, but, you know, in the context of the story Abraham is like a hundred, so who knows what like their relative age is um, for regular people. Um, and in this fatal moment, Abraham binds his son's hands, puts him down on the rock, and raises the knife above his son's chest. And raises the knife, and just in the split second moment, the moment right as Abraham would have decided to bring that knife down into his son's breast, ending his life sacrificing and murdering Isaac for the sake of his God, for the sake of his faith. Um, an angel says, whoa, whoa hold on there. Uh, see that lamb? Kill that instead. Sacrifice the lamb instead. And so Abraham takes the, the lamb from the bush, sacrifices it, unties Isaac, and they go home and live a happily ever after kind of story. So we're led to believe. How could you live happily ever, ever after that, right? Um, is Abraham a hero? I mean, in Genesis, and and really, as a as a character at the heart of the Abrahamic traditions, right? Abraham, he's the the first chosen uh, human, the the one who, through God's word and Abraham's faith sort of redeems humankind. Humans have been in a lot of trouble since Adam and Eve and Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed and stuff. And, and it's, it's through God's pact with Abraham that, um, according to this biblical tradition, that humankind is able to eventually um, begin on the path towards redemption. So certainly a hero biblically. Um, but with respect to the story, in deciding to keep the faith in deciding to sacrifice Isaac in not having to is do, do we 
see Abraham as a hero in the same sort of way, or at least analogous kind of way that we might interpret other heroes from literature, like Odysseus or um, Gilgamesh, really, these you know, adventuring heroes who conquer and uh, overcome, right? What do we think? Is Abraham a hero? Should we describe him in, him in some other way? Yeah. I'm generally more sympathetic to characters who question authorities. So mm -hmm. I'm inclined to say I wouldn't really think of him as a hero. You wouldn't because he never questions. Yeah, I mean, he, at least you would think he sees a, pro a problem here. But he's just prepared to go through with it. So to me, good. Like at least raise the issue. <laughs> yeah, which is why I ask the second question. Job does raise the issue. Um, Job, similar to Abraham, is another story of keeping the faith. Right, that um, the that, that Satan uh, kills Job's family, and Job still believes he. Uh, scours Job's fields and Job still believes. He um, strips Job naked and gives him boils uh, and uh, you know, like ruins his body and his skin and forces him to walk the desert and Job still believes until he falls to his knees in the desert, family dead, wealth gone, everything stripped from him, physical form, comfort, all of that lost. Job falls to his knees and he does question. He says, why? And, Job, and God's answer amounts to basically uh, because I'm God, right? Um, and uh, Job, in response to that answer, continues to keep his faith uh, despite the question, whether the question is um, a loss of faith at all is not described, but um, seems to me a wavering, at least like, like Job continues to have faith and God remains silent through all of the trials and tribulations until at the very end, all is lost. And so finally says, why? Well, you can't understand because I'm God, um, says God. And so Job keeps the faith and then God gives Job a new family and new cows and all is well, happily ever after. Like, what about the first family? Um, so, so why do you think Kierkegaard would choose Abraham instead of Job? Uh, it, a lot of bad things happen in both cases, but with Abraham, he's prepared to do the bad thing himself, um, whereas Job just kind of has to withstand all the bad. Receive it. Yeah, good. Pierce. Yeah, that was like kind of what I was thinking, like in the story when he was describing Abraham. Kind of seems to describe his Isaac as like his meaning for a way. So I kind of said like everything that mattered, like what mattered to Abraham. That's kind of similar with Job. But I think like the difference lies in Abraham ha like has to accept in himself like the absurdity of his meaning and choose to like kind of has to like that choice like to believe that it, like that doesn't matter. I don't know how to explain it. So yeah, it's active. Choice versus just how the absurdity happens. Like, yeah, the 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 absurdity is happening to Abraham just as it's happening to to Job, but there's an added feature in Abraham, which is that um, he must also commit himself to it. The, the furtherance of absurdity, the to to take the situation to the limits of absurdity, where. Um, with Job, it's Satan who's seemingly doing it, right? Uh, Andrew, online, you, you had a hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's um, interesting because I think Kierkegaard says um, that it's a doubt that kind of makes uh, Abraham a little more, or like his lack of doubt that makes Abraham kind of more admirable. <laughs> but then he, he also says, I think, how, um, you know, the, it would have been more human and it would have made him more like, uh, I guess, admirable according to like the world standards and not God's standards, if he had, you know, thrust the knife in his own chest instead, you know, kind of, I think that's what, you know, most people would have done rather than, you know, sacrifice their own child, but then uh, somehow, you know, his, his really going through with the absurd is kind of his, you know, like leap of faith, and that makes it kind of more, more admirable than Job even, or, um, or anyone else that's, that's confronted the absurd before. 
Yeah, the freely choosing faith as opposed to, um, well, choosing to actively, because um, Job chooses to keep his faith. He can waver at any time. But Abraham choosing faith in spite of what should certainly shatter it, right? The most human thing would be just, oh, all right, I'd rather be dead myself. Um, and Abraham chooses otherwise. And, and you got to wonder, like, <laughs> is Abraham just like totally, it, how much of a choice is it at this point? He's like 130. Uh, for 80 years, he wandered the desert and like <laughs> because of a vague promise that was finally fulfilled. And now that it's it's fulfilled, God says, all right, get rid of it. Kill the, kill the kid, right? Um, and if you're, you're that condition, right, 80 years in, like, is it really a choice or is it just what you're used to, right? Are you Stockholm syndromed into thinking, oh, well, been doing it this long, right? You get a little bit of gambler's fallacy going on, right? Um, but yeah, I, I think you guys are right um, in highlighting the, the fact that choice is what matters in the story of Abraham, that Abraham is complicit um, in the, uh, the generation of absurdity. Um, and it's because he's complicit and um, actively so in its generation that for Kierkegaard, we see this religious movement, this movement of faith um, into a religious form of life that uh, Job, was certainly faithful, but to make the movement of faith, one must use the absurdity to overcome the contradiction, right? The, the, which for Abraham is the difference between sacrifice and murder. Um, use that absurdity to resolve the contradiction. And, and that is a kind of active thing. Um, and should sound jargony, we'll explain all of this as we go forward. Okay, so, um, Kierkegaard in what we've read today describes lovely interpretations of the Binding of Isaac, four different ways of reading this story, right? Um, the ethical duty that we have when constrained or conflicted by the will of God. Um, and this is where we get some of the contradiction involved that we have an ethical duty to protect and to love our children. And the will of God is something that is infinitely beyond us. And so we must, um, insofar as God is God, submit to that will, even in contradiction with what we know to be the only good, which is protect and love our children. Don't certainly don't murder our children. Right? Um, we see themes of resignation to suffering, of recognition, clarity. Right? Uh, they say that depressed people are more realistic about the way that the world is. Well, resignation to suffering should be something like that. Right? Um, to the fact of pain and, and unhappiness in the world, and yet. Kierkegaard remains, as Ruby mentioned at the beginning of, of class, uh, lighthearted, that there seems to be a way through this mire of suffering and of resignation through the leap of faith and the use of absurd to resolve the contradictions that come from the conflict of the human will and God's will. Um, and then we get a characterization of the sort of person, the character, the hero, the knight of faith, who is moved beyond the ethical um, beyond infinite resignation, sort of like the pure representation of the ethical form of life uh, to uh, a religious existence which uh, affords salvation through use of the absurd. And Abraham is the representative of this form of life. Okay, so uh, on whether Abraham is murdering or sacrificing. If faith cannot make it a holy act, says Kierkegaard, to be willing to murder one's son, then let the same judgment be passed upon Abraham as upon everybody else. The ethical expression for what Abraham did is that he intended to murder Isaac. So from the non-religious form of life, from a purely ethical form of life, from one that is rational and sees the world as it is, is resigned to the world being the way it is, meaningless, right? but uh, factual. Uh, Abraham intended to murder Isaac. Yet the religious expression is that he intended to sacrifice Isaac. And sacrifice has a different kind of connotation than murder, right? Sacrifice is something for the sake of, 
we sacrifice the uh, lamb for the favor of the gods, right? We uh, sacrifice our uh, bread and our income so that our children can have full bellies when it's dinner time, right? Um, but in this contradiction between these two forms of life and the interpretation of the same act as either murder or as sacrifice, one is redeemable and one is so absolutely infinitely irredeemable. Um, lies precisely the anxiety that indeed can make a person sleepless. And yet Abraham is not without his anxiety. Abraham suffers from anxiety just like the rest of us. And so we have, again, a distinction between an ethical form of life and a religious one, the contradiction that gives rise to anxiety, anxiety itself, um, and Abraham suffering from his anxiety, right? These are all major themes of fear and trembling, and we'll talk about all of them. And to begin, anxiety, nausea, dread, angst, ambiguity. And these are terms of art for our existentialists. And I think this picture is like really potent at expressing dread. I, I think a Google image searched the word dread. Um, and there were a few that were like this, but this was the one that like, really, like his eyes just, they're like seeing without looking, the, the, the terror is inside. Right? Anyways, um, and just like existentialism as a term of its own, um, each of these words have their own bespoke definitions as given by each philosopher, right? Um, that every existentialist is an existentialist in their own way. Likewise, every existentialist has their own little characterization of um, the experience one has when confronted with the contradiction uh, of being the sort of thing that needs meaning and yet we exist in a meaningless world, right? So uh, anxiety is Kierkegaard's word for it, nausea, Sartre's uh, angst um, is Heidegger's ambiguity, Simone de Beauvoir's. Um, but also like existentialism in general, these words and their sort of bespoke term of art definitions hover around a, a shared experience, right? That there's something similar going on, which is a confrontation, a confrontation with absurdity. So if, like for Sartre, nausea is the experience of realizing that our consciousness of objects has no existence in the objects themselves. So um, I'm aware of the mug as a functional tool to drink my green tea, right? And yet this is just a material thing that has no cupness in it. There's no form of mug as Aristotle would tell us present in the, the object. And I, I can see that, I understand it, that without human minds, there wouldn't be a cup or a mug or green tea or any of this. And I know that, but I also know that I can't conceive of this object as anything other than what it is, right? I have to see it as having a form and an essence, as being combined, um, as Aristotle would say, hylomorphically, that matter and form are a unity in this object. And so in my conception of the object, I recognize it as being something that it is not, that it cannot be. And the recognition of that, the difference between the conception that is necessary to me and that uh, does not actually correspond to the, the world itself is where we get nausea. And uh, most uh, palpably that nausea is felt when the object is not a cup or a mug or green tea, but is ourselves. When we look at ourselves as uh, people, as, as a human, as, as an individual, as Spencer, as someone with desires and ends and aims and goals as, as a person who might describe themselves um, in, in all sorts of ways as, as having emotions. And yet none of that, it corresponds to the, the fact of me. The fact of me is like a material thing, right? And it's in that space between what I am and what I must conceive myself to be the recognition of there being a space that one has the experience of nausea. Similarly for Heidegger, Anxiety is an experience or angst is an experience of the world no longer working for you because of this realization that all of a sudden you question 
if objects are just what we ad hoc conceive them to be, and yet they are not, do they still operate as such for us? And in, in these questions, um, we cease to be able to like engage with the objects authentically, that we can't just pick it up and use it, right? I have to like think about it and sort of like orient myself, get like focus on it, and then sort of robotically use it. It's not just like as I was automatically drinking before, it doesn't work like that anymore. As soon as the world takes that nauseatic shape, as soon as the anxiety takes hold and we recognize the nothing that is in between ourselves and the world about us, right? Um, uh, okay, yeah. So for Kierkegaard, anxiety is, and this is a definition that comes from another work, freedom's actuality is the possibility of possibility. What do you think that means? Just as like a fun exercise. I'll tell you what it means in a minute, but I'm just very curious when you hear, because it's so convoluted and strange. Freedoms, actuality is the possibility of possibility. <laughs> Any guesses? Yeah. Realizing that you might be able to make a certain choice, I guess. Yeah, realizing that you might be able to make a certain choice. So um, anxiety in this case would be uh, Ivan's, Karamazov creed that everything is permissible, right? That we can nail our enemies' ears to fences and we can make babies laugh and then shoot them in the face, right? That um, anxiety is the recognition that the that that we have the power to make what is possible real. So, and then this is like a real psychological feature when um, you're holding a baby, you your brain. Some, sometimes it thinks about just like yeeting the baby away, right? Um, it's a natural thing. Like you're not a psychopath for thinking that it's a real psychological phenomenon. Um, and the one hypothesis that I've read about it is um, that that's your brain like uh, giving you sort of like a shock factor so that you don't eat the, the baby. Um, and similarly, like you're looking over a cliff and, and you have a bit of dread. Like what if I fall? But then desire, like I could fall. Right? but you're not gonna, and there's this like mixture of what could be. You have, it, it, it's within your power to fall and you wonder what it might be like to fall. And yet it's dreadful to imagine that experience of falling. And in the recognition of mm -hmm. it being permissible within your power, you're capable of realizing something um, as, as some possibilities actual that we get this anxiety. So in Abraham's case, let's apply the definition there. What, what do we think? What's Abraham's anxiety then? Anybody give it a shot? Yeah, Dylan. I think his anxiety is not following what the Lord has told him to. Yeah, not following what the Lord is, because it's within his power to do so, to, to like not follow through, right? And so it's, it's possible for... Uh, Abraham to say, yeah, I'm just not going to sacrifice Isaac today or ever. Um, thanks for giving me a son, God, and I'll see you later, right? Um, it's possible for Abraham to do that, but how terrible to revoke his faith, yet also how terrible to sacrifice your own son. Um, both possibilities are freely actualized, and Abraham is square in the middle of it. What does he do? Well, he raises the knife. Um, did Abraham decide to bring the knife down? Did the angel stop him as the knife was plunging into Isaac's chest? Did it? Did the angel stop him as he was drawing the knife from his pocket? I don't know, right? Did it happen at that like liminal moment where, like, counterfactually, he would have chosen had he been given, like, you know, just another time slice? Um, Again, we don't know, but what we do know is that Abraham's anxiety was his ability or, or the, the three days that he spent uh, chopping the wood and taking Isaac up to that mountain and having always open to him both uh, accedence or um, uh, denial of God's will. So anxiety here is a kind of contradictory state. It represents a contradictory state where we dread what could be um, 
and we desire two different um, states of being, right? That we, in the shoes of Abraham, both desire to follow the will of God and to have Isaac, right? Um, and this is a contradiction. We can't have both, at least from the ethical standpoint of infinite resignation, the very clear crystalline view of the world is a factual place, but not a spiritual one, right? You can't have both. You follow the will of God and you kill your son or, and you sacrifice your son, or you do not follow the will of God and you refuse to murder your son. But this contradictory state is Abraham's MO and he's been living it for 80 years, right? He's been in absurdity. He's been in contradiction. He's been following a promise that has not been fulfilled for more than a normal human lifespan. Um, and this in itself is a venerable achievement of faith. And this is why God gifts him, gifts Abraham, Isaac. Uh, and yet the testing is not over. It only gets harder. But what did Abraham have faith in? What did Abraham do? He arrived neither too early nor too late. He mounted the ass and rode slowly along the way. During all this time, he believed. He believed that God would not demand Isaac of him, while he was still willing to sacrifice him if it was demanded. He believed by virtue of the absurd for human calculation was out of the question, and it was indeed absurd that God, who demanded it of him, in the next instance would revoke the demand. He climbed the mountain, and even at the moment when the knife gleamed, he believed that God would not demand Isaac. Now, hear that description of Abraham, and then let's look at this. Does this look like the face of an Abraham who believed that even in raising the knife and seeing the glint of its steel against the sun, that he would be delivered, that Isaac would be delivered to him? I don't think so. I think Carvajal had a very different interpretation of Abraham than Kierkegaard does. This one is not someone who believed at all, but is surprised. Or maybe he doesn't even have the emotional capacity for surprise, but only for the pain that was imposed upon him, right? In needing, in being in that state of anxiety, right? So Abraham, according to Kierkegaard at least, believed that through God all things are possible. That one with the faith of a mustard seed, one with faith like a mustard seed can move mountains, I think is the quote. In spite of the fact that this faith demanded a contradiction, it was possible to will both the death and the persistence of a son through God. So God's demand for Isaac is a sacrifice Abraham's plunging the knife downwards is a murder, and the simultaneity of these descriptions is absurd. And yet, Abraham arrived neither too early nor too late. He believed the whole way he um, went just as fast as he needed to because he was the religious hero, the one who has faith, right? The one who is resigned to the fact of the necessity of murdering his son, and yet somehow through faith, through the dance of faith, knows he will be delivered. Isaac will be delivered to him. So um, there's an acceptance or equanimity in the face of contradiction, in the face of absurdity, that requires the use of absurdity um, through the movement of faith. So what are the movements of faith? Well, it's a two-step process. One is to be infinitely resigned to the world, right? the ethical world. We see the world for what it is, and we say, wow, oh, that's pretty awful. But then we take another step and we begin to dance. We engage in what Kierkegaard calls the teleological suspension of the ethical through the religious reception of the absurd. And how that looks is he resigned everything infinitely and then grasped everything again by virtue of the absurd. It is supposed to be the most difficult task for a dancer to leap into a particular posture in such a way that there is no second when he grasps at the position but assumes it in the leap itself. Perhaps no dancer can do it, but that night does. The majority of people live absorbed in the worldly sorrow and joy. There are wallflowers who do not join in the dance. The knights of infinity are dancers and have elevation. So what Abraham does 
has resigned himself to the world. He sees it for what it is, and yet imbues it with the spiritual power, the spiritual power of faith and contradiction. And, and the, the image here, the metaphor of the dancer sort of being mid pirouette and recognizing the fact that they're mid pirouette and performing it fluidly, I think is kind of telling. Um, it's a kind of uh, expertise in life. It's, it's an ability to both be in a state of uh, knowledge and being with the world. If um, Sartre and Heidegger's nausea have to do with this like recognizing the difference between the world of conception as we must have it and the world as material as it actually is and anxieties in the in-between. The, the knight of faith is the one who recognizes this and it doesn't disturb them. It doesn't give them any anxiety because they have faith. Okay, so let's look at these two steps um, side by side. Infinite resignation being first. Infinite resignation is giving up what is most beloved to you so as not to contradict who you are. Um, like with the story of the falling in love with the princess, you love the, the your, your lover and you say, look, um, if I love it, I'll let it go. And if it loves me back, it'll return kind of thing. Our souls are without concentration and strength, able to, to be entirely independent and unaffected entities. We live in the world and the world affects us, right? Um, but we can be infinitely resigned to the world and have it not affect us. We can be independent from the world. Um, we don't need to lean on anyone or anything to stand on our own. We can um, live with a certain sort of resolve and strength. And it is the strength that comes from resignation to the world. Deeper natures never forget themselves and never become anything other than what they were. So there's a way that we are, um, each as individuals, each as people, and we can realize that without help um, through infinite resignation, says Kierkegaard. So we resign ourselves to the world of suffering in spite of our high moral ideals of utopia and happiness. We want the world to be perfect. We see the world for what it is, which is imperfect. Um, and we resign ourselves to individuality in an existence that calls for love and community. At the end of the day, we all die alone. So let us be resigned to the fact that we are alone, even in life. And it would be better to give up attachments, but in the finitude of life, we need to grasp all that we can. So we resign ourselves infinitely to everything. And so become alone, an individual. But in being alone, an individual have sight of, have clear sight of everything else. Just as Ivan has resigned to the problem of evil. Ivan sees the world very clearly, right? He has his answers to the eternal questions. Um, he is completely resigned to the world. That is why he does not accept it. He stands apart from it. He'll return his ticket. So Kierkegaard calls this um, bourgeoisie philistinism. So the idea being that if you're an Ivan-like character who doesn't take the leap of faith, if you just perfect the infinite resignation, then you're a bourgeoisie philistine. You're like sort of privileged and so privileged that you're able to uh, say, well, screw all this stuff. It's just sucks. Just like Ivan, right? He comes from a family of power and uh, education and he has a some income and so he can live without needing to work very hard or really at all um, and this gives him a position from which he can see the world as one rife with suffering um, it's something that in Anna Karenina uh, Levin approaches so if you're familiar with the story of Anna Karenina Levin is similarly from a position of privilege and power and um, has an income and, and some estates and um, and there's a, a scene where Levin, this sort of almost aristocratic sort of person, um, close to aristocratic person, um, goes to the fields to like work with the peasants and joyfully sort of recognizes how amazing it is to not have to think about all of the, the facts and features of the world to just be able to like work and harvest grass, right? You get into a flow state. Um, and, uh, and Levin is almost completely seduced by this. Like I should just give up everything and be a peasant. Um, he eventually isn't, but um, uh, the, the bourgeoisie Philistinism is what comes when you don't, when, when you have ascended the passionate life, the one that is the life of the peasant who just like goes through the day working and putting bread on the table to survive. Um, and you are, 
and you begin to philosophize about the world, you begin to theorize the world, you crystallize it and see it um, crystal clear, but you don't fill it with faith, right? The whole world is a clearance cell, says um, Johannes de Silencio. Uh, and this is problematic. So to stop at this infinite resignation is to be a Philistine, a sort of reductive materialist, a nihilist of sorts, um, who says, look, it all sucks, period. It is essential that infinite resignation is not to be a one-sided result of a cruel necessity. And certainly, the more this is granted, the more dubious it always becomes whether the movement is proper. Thus, if one thinks that a cold, barren necessity necessarily must be granted, one implies thereby that no one can experience death before actually dying, which strikes me as a crass materialism. That this is representative of our bourgeoisie world, the one that is faithless, the one that lacks spiritual connection to um, the passionate features of the world, the, the, the part that makes life meaningful, right? Can we have both a clear representation of the world and feel like it's important and meaningful to us, right? Um, only through faith and only through the religious life is such a thing possible. Um, as Ivan says in his Philistine attitude, my Euclidean mind cannot accept it. Should in the infinite span of things parallel lines cross, I would not accept it. So what would Kierkegaard say to someone like Ivan? Well, infinite resignation is the last stage made before faith, so that whoever has not made this movement does not have faith. For only in infinite resignation do I become transparent to myself in my eternal validity, and only then can there be talk of laying hold of existence by virtue of faith. And according to Kierkegaard, Ivan will fail by not taking this final step of faith. Ivan and his world are transparent, but cruelly so. Alyosha, on the other hand, in being, remember the, the, the question that Ivan imposes upon Alyosha, like, would you torture to death the single child to recognize the world of perfect harmony? And Alyosha says, no, I would not consent. That this might be a movement of infinite resignation. Alyosha resigning himself to the fact that he would not consent to be the architect of this world at the, the price that is required of it. Uh, and yet Alyosha continues to live in faith and so might be a representative of the, the night of faith as Kierkegaard would have it. So the night of faith is clearly conscious of um, their infinite infinitely resigned world, the contradictory qualities of the world, the fact that we want it to be utopic, but it is not and we can't um, unify it. It's all individual and material. The Knight of Faith sees all of this just as well as their your bourgeoisie Philistine. Um, consequently, the only thing that can save the Knight of Faith from the absurd is the absurd itself. And this he lays hold of by faith. He therefore acknowledges the impossibility and at the same time, or at the same moment, believes the absurd. So in a state of infinite resignation, we are resigned to the way the world is, we also recognize what the world could be, and we have this contradiction. The contradiction gives rise to the absurd, and so the Knight of Faith uses faith to take hold of the absurd, says Kierkegaard, and use that faith to heal the contradiction. Right? So absurdity is itself um, a relationship to contradiction, but it is one that um, is neither meaninglessness nor utopic conception, right, uh, ideal or material. It's the, the contradictory mix of the two, and Kierkegaard thinks that we use that to resolve the contradictions that come from an infinite resignation. And uh, we do so in a lighthearted dance. Um, we do so by taking a leap of faith to be resigned to a positive belief via acceptance of the absurd. For it is by faith that Abraham did not renounce Isaac, but by faith, Abraham received Isaac. Abraham is a knight of faith. He renounces and resigns himself to the sacrifice, to the murder of his most beloved son. And he opens himself up through faith in the absurd to willfully believe also that through God, all things are possible, that through willing the sacrifice and the murder simultaneously, it's contradictory sort of will um, having contradictory will, it is through faith that God will give Isaac back. It is only in willing the act that causes the contradiction um, and having faith that God will resolve that contradiction that the contradiction will actually be resolved. 
So we see before us in the pit of anxiety, of dread, of despair, of nausea, empty nothingness, as Heidegger and Sartre would have it. Kierkegaard recommends we jump into it. Take that absurdity, take that emptiness, take that nothingness, and make it an object of faith. Appropriate it into your spirit, into your soul, into your individual self, the self that is apart from the whole world through infinite resignation. And in doing so, God will resolve your contradictions, right? The absurd will heal you. Resignation reveals contradiction and the absurd in contradiction. Faith in the absurd resolves contradiction, at least so says Kierkegaard. But what, what do you guys think? Does a leap of faith into the absurd satisfy anxiety, nausea, dread? Right? Do we think that absurdity resolves contradiction? Yeah. Um, I think all the inherent in the question is like like a call to action. So you have to like seek yourself if it does. Yeah. Um, so it might just be, uh, and I, I like this point. I, I think you're probably totally right because the author himself says, look, I'm not a knight of faith. Um, the author being Johannes de Silencio, right? Um, I'm just the one who's given you the ideas, right? Um, and the ideas themselves are just as well objects of infinite resignation as any other utopic ideal. It's up to you to take the leap because the leap requires your own individual passion, right? Um, so in that sense, it might be an empirical question. Um, but then do you think you can fail? Um, I think if you do fail, then I guess the author by just saying, by just putting himself and placing himself as a questioner kind of absolves himself of any guilt. Like if someone does take a leap of faith and then their life just goes nowhere, yeah. then this author can just say, or anyone who, who calls someone to action like that, can just say, no, I was just asking a question. Yeah. He kind of just presents the, the option. Yeah. Kind of uh, it, it almost strikes me as like cowardly, right? It, to, to prescribe a, a solution, a paved path to um, redemption, but then to not oneself be committed to it or even committed to other people's following through with it seems like almost wanton. Yeah, it's an interesting take. Yeah. I think, I think also if it was more direct and if he was saying you need to do this, I think that that there's something about being told what to do, or like the difference between an order and an invitation, where if someone were to take it, it doesn't have the same power and like weight and like realness to it. Yeah, so so maybe in that sense, uh, it's not a matter of cowardice, but of necessity, which is something that we might be resigned to, that we can't, we, we have to will uh, faith in the absurd ourselves for ourselves, um, that I, I can't do that work for you. Um, I can get you one step to the point of choice, but um, the choice must be yours, failure or otherwise. Um, if you want to resolve this, you're going to have to be in a state of anxiety. Yeah, okay, cool. Did, I saw a couple other hands, Pierce Shane. Stu, Shane, Pierce, Shane, Jason. Uh, if anybody wants to reply to his, maybe she plans to change the subject. So, oh, anyway. does anybody have replies, follow-ups? I was just more like going to say, like with the, like to the point of like, can you fail? I feel like uh, my interpretation of kind of what you're trying to say is that if you're a knight of faith. The idea, like in the example of Abraham, I was thinking that like he's trying to say is more so that one has to be so like absolved of everything and in like the absurd, like in like with one with the absurd, that failure isn't like 
they have to accept that a failure isn't a failure, that it's kind of like this grand work almost. It's like they can't think of it as like, I can fail. It's just like something that you have to do. Like, like, like with like, like if we talk about like Joe, like it wasn't like that Joe didn't fail. It's that that was like a grand work, like understanding the absurdity of life and that there isn't failure. It's just what's done almost. Yeah, I like this response too, that, that the idea of there being failure in faith is just like nonsensical, right? That the, the dance that the Knight of Faith performs uh, might include stumbling, but that's just a part of the dance. Yeah, cool. Um, I think also if the faith does encompass some end like death, like if there is like the confrontation of death with the leap of faith, then even someone dying isn't a real, uh, like that they're already sort of resigned to their own ultimate failure, I guess, if that's how, if that's, how, if that's what death is. Yeah, because because infinite resignation requires a, just as with the clarity of like the evil in the world, the fact of like, our finitude we um are not infinite things and, and we have to be resigned to our temporality so this Kierkegaard over and over right um and so so like to make the leap of faith both metaphorical and literal it, you know the, the fact that he hit the ground might just be um the failure that you are inevitably resigned to and yet it was the falling along the way that was done religiously and so makes it valuable satisfies the anxiety uh, absolves the anxiety perhaps in the, the falling um you fall with a smile on your face maybe yeah shane uh, it, uh when you take the leap of faith why um instead of finding god who's to say you don't find the flying spaghetti monster oh like why are we uh why is kierkegaard christian as opposed yeah, like, to there seems to be nothing inherent about this leap of faith that you should end at a Christian God. Yeah, I think this is a good question. Um, I don't know enough about Kierkegaard um, to answer that question. I, like I've, the, the only Kierkegaard I've read in full is Fear and Trembling like three times, um, four times. Um, I haven't read his other stuff and I don't know enough about Kierkegaard, like the man to answer that question. Um, there's like a sociological answer, which is just that like he was a part of a Christian community as, as a Dane and, you know, whenever he was writing, 1800s, I think, early 1800s. Um, so that was just like what was believed. And so no surprise that he also believed it. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, I, I, I agree that at least if we take fear and trembling alone, and I sort of mentioned this earlier, I don't think there's anything particularly Christian about it necessarily. If, if you think that faith and uh, spiritual power, capacity are features of being human, um, then yeah, flying spaghetti monster, Abrahamic God, um, maybe no God at all, but just like reality of um, some like spiritual holism in the world, whatever, um, are the things that uh, faith absolves anxiety through. Um, there is some necessity that the God that one has faith in um, has power, right? Because it's through faith in God that willing to sacrifice Isaac is what delivers Isaac back. Um, and that's not accidental, right? That, that's very active, that God is like returning Isaac to, um, to Abraham because God is able to act through contradiction. Um, but that uh, effective power doesn't need to be a triumphantly perfect being um, of any particular story, I, I don't think. It just, there has to be something with the power to, through absurdity, absolve anxiety at, uh, that, that arises from contradiction. That, that's like all that's required, uh, I suppose, logically, but from like the construction of the like, Kierkegaard's claim. So good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a quick second take. Sure. Which would be, as soon as we return to everything is permissible in a leap of faith. Every, sorry? Like, as soon as we return back to everything is permissible, because in a leap of faith, it, it's not necessarily a Christian God. You could leap of faith to anything, 
as long as you believe that it brings you this, this thing that you want. And if you suspend ethics to do this, then it seems everything is permissible. Yeah, so, so that's the, the next slide is the discussion of the teleological suspension of the ethical. That you're suspending the, the ethicals, you're, you're resigned to the fact that the um, plunging the knife into Isaac's chest is a murder, right? which is the ethical conception of it. But you're also suspending that conception of, of the act as murder for this teleological end, which is like the, the act is for the sake of sacrifice for like the glory of God. Um, and uh, it's in the suspension of the ethical for this teleological that you don't like forget the ethical, it's still murder, um, but the teleological sort of like supersedes it. And that part, I, I don't even really understand how Kierkegaard makes that point, but he does make that point that, that comes up. Um, Ryan, you asked the, the same sort of question. Does the leap of faith only work with the belief in a higher power through God, all things are possible? Um, for Kierkegaard, yeah, I, I think so. Like it, through God, all things are possible. There has to be some force, some active, effective power, which empowered by, uh, so like absurdity is the fuel and faith is the, the spark that ignites it in, in combustion, um, absolves contradiction um, because of the process of the teleological suspension of the ethical. Uh, Shane. It's kind of along the same lines of Shane and really necessitate God like or human belief it's, uh, me I just go I don't believe that faith will put me in heaven when I'm dead you know anything like that but I, I see there's like psychological merit to being able to embrace absurdity and that does satisfying the nausea dread I don't know what the like psychological mechanism is but I've seen it um, in situations where you're in so much danger or so much exhaustion or you're in like the most terrible working conditions that just think like you're in the army like in Iraq doing some scary stuff or whatnot so at some point you just say okay we have to embrace this suck and then everything's kind of okay it's like this is where we are this is what we're dealing with and I don't know I, I just wonder if he's pointing to if you if he had written this 150 years later in like a post everybody believes in God society, if this would have been more of a psychological take than, you know, talking about some kind of anxiety, nausea, dread, relieving mechanism in us to just embrace these things. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, yeah, the, the sociological point is, is interesting. Um, Cause you have like spiritual follow-ups to Kierkegaard, the, the tried and true existentialists who are, I mean, they're, they're writing um, from the perspective of, a world that has been destroyed by itself, right? Post-World War II, um, the Nazification of, of Europe, the um, destruction of an entire culture and people, um, the uh, loss of life just in the millions, right? Um, that the, the answer that our French existentialists give um, is not to accept the absurd. Right, um, that that is it's unacceptable because the absurdity is so terrible. Um, their answer is to rebel against it or use it for uh, as an effective force of like collective good um, in Sartre and Bivouac's case. So, so if if there's like an analogy to be drawn there, um, I think Kierkegaard might. Kierkegaard in, in the spirit of like post destruction of world, um, post belief in God, be realized just like the other French existentialists did. Um, and it might be through a kind of naivete that um, Kierkegaard is able to say, or is inspired to say that acceptance of the absurd is what um, absolves the contradictions and, and what um, frees us from anxiety, perhaps. Yeah, do you think, um, I haven't read, Sartre or any of these you will. That we're going to read. Yeah. yeah. So um, but I was just gonna say, do you think Victor Frankel would be more in line with him? Yeah, yeah. Because he, he was, was certainly you know, same era. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in a concentration camp. So it was like uh not just uh, uh bystander yeah. in as much as 
the French existentialists were biased. I mean, they were like in France and like were oh, yeah. part of it, but like he was, Frankel was uh, oh, subjugated to as bad as it gets, right? Um, yeah, Frankel is definitely um, uh, more optimistic and more, um, yeah, uh, able to to handle absurdity. And, and I think you're right that like the soldier thing that uh, I, I'm reminded when I read Kierkegaard of the Taoists who similarly sort of accept the unreason of the world, the incapacity to, to naturalize it, the usefulness of naturalizing, but um, to do so in, to anachronize Buddhist language to the Taoists, to like to, to recognize the unreason of the world and, and usefulness of naturalizing um, without attachment. Uh, and just like live naturally. And there's an, a certain sort of flavor of absurdity that comes with this living naturally um, that includes both naturalization and contradiction, um, but it just sort of works for us. Um, and, and that seems to be kind of a, a positive spin on the acceptance of absurdity. Um, as, I suppose it's another side note. There are other hands though. Yeah, Jason. I was just going to say to the original question of the leap of faith satisfies the anxiety that it seems like even in the night of faith, some anxiety remains, or at least it comes up from time to time. Because in at least like one or two of his characterizations of Abraham, Abraham has a lot of anxiety in the like three days leading up to it. So it seems like rather than there being a leap of faith, that sometimes it's something you have to do sort of continuously and you know, every time the anxiety yeah. comes up, you have to once again take the leap of faith. It's not just a thing you do one time and then you're the night of faith from then on. Yeah, the dance is an ecstatic thing, right? It, you you continue to perform. Um, good. I, I like this point too. I, I hadn't thought of it, um, and and I like have it written in the the PowerPoint that uh, what does Kierkegaard say that Abraham uh, is a man of his own anxieties, or like like he's just been anxious his whole life with the, the unresolved promise and now the binding of his son to be sacrificed. Um, the, yeah, the, the, the leap of faith is not, but you think of a leap of faith as a metaphor and you, you jump once, you know, like you're, you're off the cliff. Uh, you're, you're flying or falling with style, you know, whatever, right? Um, but in the context of, you know, like living, uh, yeah, it wouldn't just happen once. Uh, and maybe even it seems to me that the, the contradictions will come right back, which would be consistent with the, the four stories told at the beginning, right? And, and the, the analogy drawn between the, the telling, the different tellings of the binding of Isaac to the weaning mother, right? That in every case, the child is weaned and that's a separation. And so there, the, the contradiction is past, um, but looking back is just as hard, right? You're no, you're no longer unified with your, your child in that sort of way. Um, and so there might be sort of retrospective anxiety in that as well. And a, a new leap required in the, the passing and overcoming of each moment of contradiction and absurdity. Yeah, good. That's a cool point. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I think, like, to your point about, um, like, it being, like, one leap of faith or, like, continuous, I think the idea in, like, in the Abrahamic story is because it is such a significant moment, any moment that could come after it would be almost nothing in comparison to what that initial act was. And so yeah. in that way, it's kind of like if you've already done that massive leap of faith, all the other small leaps of faith leaps of faiths aren't really like anything yeah maybe this is what makes for kierkegaard abraham a hero right like i asked the question is do we think that abraham is a hero well kierkegaard certainly did um and from the story alone that might be sort of hard to conceive but um from this perspective now that we're sort of at the end of the the theory um we might get a picture of abraham as a hero for just this reason that abraham followed through the covenant uh, the promise and was satisfied, but the the most powerful test of faith was the um, sacrifice of the covenant that he waited so long to be realized. Um, 
And this is what makes Abraham the hero, that you can't imagine uh, a greater trial, a greater tribulation, and Abraham overcame that. And so though there still will be anxiety and the required, uh, the, the, the required movements of faith going forward, uh, the, the peak is behind him. And, and so that the respect that we um, sort of must have for Abraham uh, is already written stone. Good. Okay, so what's the content of the movement of faith? Like, what does it mean to make a movement of faith? Well, I don't really know, to be honest with you guys. Um, it's to suspend one's judgment of the ethical for the sake of the universal. This is the second half of um, Fear and Trembling, uh, which deals with the three problems, the teleological suspension of the ethical. Um, was it ethically defensible of Abraham to conceal his undertaking from his wife and from Isaac, and is there an absolute duty to God? So the way that these problems work is using Hegelian dialectic, um, which Kierkegaard was not a, a fan of. He was not a fan of Hegel, but it was like the form of doing philosophy and arguing at the time, which uh, I'm not a Hegel scholar, nor really a Kierkegaard scholar, just I think I said, read this book. Um, so I'm not super well-versed in Hegel. I can't tell you much about how dialectic works. Um, but in a word, it has to do with a synthesis of thesis and antithesis. So you present an idea and then it's antithesis and you synthesize them. And this forwards the conversation or the concept. Um, if you're talking about a conversation or concept, or if you're say like Marx, um, then you're uh, doing a sort of socio-political synthesis of opposing ideas. Uh, and for Hegel, there was uh, an end of history, right? This sort of completion of, of philosophy, of um, figuring it all out. Uh, and similar for Marx, there's a political end of history where we've sort of given up politics and we've given up religion. We've given up all of these masks, as he called them, these facades of how to think and understand the world. Um, and we're just sort of able to operate in it together where we don't like over materialize each other or ourselves and we all live in happy harmony. Um, and that just comes through like the ultimate synthesis at the end of things. Um, so uh, Kierkegaard does something similar with his questions. Do we have an absolute duty to God? Well, of course, but we also have an absolute duty to our children. And so there's an antithesis, right? And uh, thesis and the synthesis is again, overcome uh, through faith. And likewise, the teleological suspension of the ethical and the lying to your family, these are all just like more examples of this um, synthesis of thesis, antithesis, contradictions, right, together. It's through faith that the contradictions are resolved, that the Hegelian dialectic is satisfied, et cetera. So um, next week, uh, we'll have our second meeting of the Simone Bay reading group, uh, and we'll discuss Nietzsche and the problem of nihilism. So Nietzsche is not a nihilist. Uh, in fact, nihilism is like his target. How do we like resolve and overcome it? Um, and I think I've assigned some passages from Zarathustra, some passages from the gay science, and then the large selection is from an early essay in a collection of essays called The Untimely Meditations. Um, the essay that I've selected is Schopenhauer's Educator. So I sort of think that Schopenhauer's Educator is an excellent picture of Nietzsche because it's written when Nietzsche was still a professor at Basel, the University of Basel, uh, before he begins to speak like purely in metaphor and aphorism. Um, and yet I think it carries with it all of sort of what Nietzsche would develop uh, later through his metaphor and aphorism um, in books like The Gay Science and Beyond Good and Evil, like all of them, right? Um, but it's just really clear and it's really excellent. It has to do with um, uh, like, being a young person or a person at all and um, figuring out how to like live meaningfully and well. It says like, look back on the experiences of your life and uh, find the principle that uh, unifies those activities that made you happy and let that be the principle of your life henceforth, right? It's really beautiful stuff. Um, and so we'll get uh, an expression of the problem of nihilism of uh, some of Nietzsche's suggested, like, here's what we should hope for in overcoming the nihilism of the world. And uh, finally, in Schopenhauer's Educator, 
uh, a path in ourselves to um, recognize where the problems of nihilism of what we might have been calling in this class absurdity um, affect us and how uh, to overcome. Okay, so uh, we'll also wrap up our unit on religious and proto-existentialism. With Nietzsche, we'll, we will move on to um, our core existentialist. So after the Nietzsche reading, we'll do our movie night, uh, which is The Seventh Seal. It's an awesome movie. It's basically like all of the ideas that we've been reading uh, turned into a film. So in a lot of ways, it's just this book made a movie. Uh, and Ingmar Bergman, the director, is a total badass, and all of his films are fantastic. Seventh Seal is like the most famous of them. Um, so we'll watch that in class, do a movie night. Um, that lecture will go a little bit late. Um, and, and I gave you guys a link on the syllabus to the movie so you can watch it yourselves. Um, but I'll like show it. I'm going to bring my Blu-ray player and we'll watch it on Blu-ray on the TV. And um, I'll bring popcorn and snacks for everybody. So that'll be a, a fun thing. And then we'll have like a discussion afterwards of the movie. Uh, and then we'll move into our existentialist proper. And that's the end. So see you next week for Nietzsche. Thank you.